thank God. Welcome to church this morning. Help us sing. We're going to sing Power in the Blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of... There is power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Power, power, wonder-working power in the press. One more time. There is power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank God. Welcome out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to be continuing in this room the series Pastor Greg started, Memorial Stones. There is also Sunday School for all ages throughout the building. You can see an usher. We also have a Spanish Sunday School this morning. Let's begin. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity to learn about our rich history, the miracles that you've worked for us, God. Help us to have open hearts. Anoint Pastor Greg this morning in Jesus' name. Check. There we go. Good morning. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua chapter 4. And we're going to continue our series on memorial stones. We're looking uh, at the history of our fellowship, telling the story for those who don't know the story. But uh, this is not just reminiscence. We are learning lessons. Uh, and where did we come from? Why do we do what we do today and then making sure that we line up with and we keep that? This is the principle of memorial stones. Let's read Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take a pot. <clears throat> Take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones <coughs> shall be a, for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, so we're looking uh, today the early... Prescott Outreach and uh, Concert Ministry. The, if you're new here, uh, our church was uh, uh, founded, our fellowship was founded by my father. And I told in earlier lessons, my parents were raw sinners, completely unchurched, and they had gotten saved. My parents, what they wanted to see, they wanted to get sinners saved like them but he didn't know how my parents got saved because their uh, first child at 10 months suddenly died and this caused them to be desperate uh, his uh, oldest brother and his wife uh, reached out to them invited them to church so it wasn't they didn't get saved because of an outreach they got saved because of a crisis. They were willing to come to church. Then he eventually becomes a pastor. He is wanting people to get saved. Some of you, it is completely normal. You do outreaches. My dad had no file for that. He had never really seen that. He was taught in Bible school and in an organization he was a part of is basically you wait for sinners to come to you or the only idea they had to attract sinners was you do kitty programs, you do kitty contests so that kids will come in the hopes that they will bring their parents, but that, that didn't work. So consequently, the frustration for my dad is he saw hardly any sinners saved and he did not know really how. If sinners came to church, no problem. My dad was a fireball. He would preach. 
he would pull an altar call. That's fine, but how do you get sinners into church? I told last week, then uh, through uh, circumstances, Ron and Susie Burrow were the first hippies. They had just gotten saved, came into church during a Johnny Metzler revival, and uh, out of that, they became part of the church, began witnessing to their friends and bringing others. But the moment that Ron Burrow got saved and then some others, they began telling my dad how music would draw young people. and began to tell him, if we were to play music, if we were to put on a concert, we could advertise that young people, they would come. And so you have to understand that my dad had... This was absolutely foreign to him, but he said, let's do that. I, I showed last week uh, just one photo. We did the first concert at, at a building. It was called the Boys Club. The building's not there anymore on Gurley Street, but uh, in that, they can put up the picture. Is uh, like 100 visitors came out. The majority of them were young people. 40 people got saved. You, you, you have to understand how absolutely mind-blowing this was. I told you last week that when they went to Los Angeles, they went to La Habra, California, to what he had heard was called a coffee house. I still have no idea why they called them coffee houses. Very little coffee was involved in them, but that's what they called them. It was a precursor to what we know as a concert ministry. Young people sitting on the floor, they're playing music, and then they would preach and pull altar calls. They're telling testimonies, very similar to uh, what we do today. The man who was putting that on was a man named Don Madison. And so dad had invited him, come to Prescott and bring one of these bands that you uh, have. And so that's what happened, is that in the second concert that we did at the Boys Club, Don Madison came and brought a band called Covadas. Let, let me see a picture here. The, uh, this is uh, the, some of the crowd. That's the band there. And then the next picture, this is actually the band Covadas that came and played. And again, young people came. Total sinners came. And then the gospel was preached and people got saved. So for many of you, if you're a part of our church, that's, that's just as normal as breathing. That's the way it's always been. This was absolutely revolutionary, is you could put on an event that in some way would attract sinners. And so uh, numbers of our concerts were initially at the Boys Club. At the Boys Club, a uh, uh, young teenage demon named Tom Lehman helpfully threw in an M80, uh, firecracker, which is basically a quarter stick of dynamite, threw that in there. And, uh, but God has a sense of humor. Tom Lehman eventually got saved, is in our church uh, today. A young, uh, uh, young lady came and got saved. Uh, I don't remember her maiden name, but Margaret Houghton. She married and she was Margaret Houghton. Margaret Houghton was very musical, tremendous piano player, played guitar. And she began to sing put together a girls group called Living Waters. We have a picture of one of the early concerts. Here is Margaret playing uh, at the boys club and then uh, young ladies. Uh, the next picture here is Living Waters. This was the, there were numbers of, of uh, permutations as they would get sent out. They'd bring in new girls and whatnot. But uh, you see here, uh, I know it's at an angle, Margaret's playing, that's, uh, Bobby McKinney, she was Copeland then, Veronica, I don't remember her last name, that's Mona Warner's sister, Diane Russell, uh, Patty Dunlap, if I remember right, our own Kathy Garfield, Kathy and the Blonde, she was the very, she was saved in the very first Boys Club concert. My sister Sharon, my sister Karen, that's Janet uh, Payson as she was then, now Janet Foley, she'll be with us here this morning, and then I think that's uh, Mona Warner if I'm not mistaken, on the far right. And so they began to play, but I, I want to emphasize to you, in these original concerts to my father, this was absolutely revolutionary. You could draw people. 
You could do something and sinners would come and then you could preach them. So here's a lesson that we use to this day and that is the lesson of outreach. So the idea, my dad had been raised, you wait for sinners to come to you, which by and large across the world hardly ever happens in any churches. Talked to a man the other day, he said that his uh, grandson has been going to a church for two years. In two years, not one person has gotten saved, nor have they made any attempt to go out where sinners are in any way. Outreach, reaching out. You have to go where sinners are. We didn't wait for the sinners to come to church. We went out into a neutral venue to reach them. So outreach is find a crowd, right? There may be an existing crowd. Why are they there? They're for a sports event. They're in a park. They're at the lake, whatever. Where will a crowd be? You could go where a crowd is and preach in some way, or what the concert ministry was, create a crowd. In this instance, you're thinking, what would someone unsaved be willing to come to? And in this case, it was music. That is the principle that we use to this day. Find a crowd, create a crowd. Now, I'm not talking about now just personal witnessing, I'm talking about an outreach an outreach, therefore, can be anything. Literally, you are thinking. We have, I uh, remember many years ago, one of the guys in the church, he, uh, he held a menudo night. Now, to me, that's not very exciting. Intestine soup is not exciting to me. But that is something that attracts people so we can preach. There can be literally anything. Uh, and we've done all kinds of uh, different events. But that is something, that principle is now foundational to our fellowship. We do not in our fellowship wait for sinners to come here. We are going after them. And in an outreach, apart from just one-on-one -on -one witnessing on the job or school or whatever, outreach, find a crowd, create a crowd. We use that to this day. And what I want to emphasize to you, the idea for outreach did not come from the pastor. My dad did not wake up and suddenly say, rock and roll is the answer. <laughs> it was someone who said, in the congregation, who said, you know what, I think that people would come if we did this. And that is true to this day uh, many, many of our outreach ideas, if not most, have not come from the pastors. They've come from people who are thinking, how can we attract sinners? Another lesson in the, in the early part of our uh, uh, move in the Jesus movement, here's a lesson that has to do with the priority of personal witness. Very, very common in churches that people who say they are saved, never witness. I could have quoted statistics for you. It's a very small percentage of Christians ever tell someone unsaved about Jesus. Lisa and I, uh, we lived in Perth, West Australia. We went uh, at least once a week to a local uh, place where they, they shopped in, in Australia. Originally, they didn't have indoor malls. It was outdoor kind of on the street, we witnessed there. For years, there was no other church ever that witnessed except for one church of Christ had one man who would witness, it would be there at the same time. He was the paid witnesser for the church. So the church said, sinners need to get saved, someone needs to witness, they hired a guy. That was his job, was to witness, and their job was done, <laughs> right? So this, was, this is very, very common. Uh, you know, there are people sometimes they've said, you know, you think you act like you're the, you're the only uh, uh, Christians in the city. And I said, absolutely not. We are not the only Christians in our city. 
But if you had to measure it by how many other Christians ever witness, you would think so. But we don't have any competition. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's never like, man, it's so crowded here with all these Christians witnessing to sinners. We better go somewhere else. Because it's very common, Christians don't witness, but real conversion produces a desire to tell other people. This is a mark. You can tell whether someone has the good. There are a lot of people that pray the prayer, right? Actually, I tell the guys in, when they're giving report, they say, you know, we had 10 people give their lives. To, we don't know whether they gave their lives yet. What they did is pray. How do you know whether someone really, really got the goods? Do they want to witness? Because there's something normal about someone whose life is a uh, uh, change. John 4, 28 through 30. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to town. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Do you think he might be the Christ? So the people left the town and went to see Jesus. Okay, that's the pattern of real conversion. She meets Jesus Christ. What is the very first thing that she wants to do? She goes and tells people. Because that's what happened. Ron Burrow was the original, Ron and Susie were the original hippies in our church, the very first young couple that came in. And from the moment that Ron Burrow got saved, he told everyone. He was a witnessing machine. He had been a, a part of a local band that was just achieving some success called Eden. And in uh, his conversion, God convicted him that he should not be playing for the devil anymore. And in the middle of a concert, made up his mind, I am quitting the band. He told his half-brother, Walter Portugal, I'm quitting the band. You can bring my uh, guitar, my equipment home. I'm out of here. Eden continued on. Uh, I got a picture here. Here is Eden. Uh, they continued on. They were going to try to still make it. They had just signed a contract, recorded a couple of tracks. They were going to keep trying to keep going as a three-piece. Ron Burrow, here uh, is uh, Steve Haru uh, in the right picture. Steve Haru's on the left. Walter Portugal, that's Ron's half-brother. Kurt McKinney in the front. Ron Burrow wanted them to get saved. He wrote them each a letter every day and would tell them. There was no email in those days. Every day he wrote them a letter witnessing and telling them about Jesus. And ultimately, all three of these young men, they all got saved as well. So witnessing actually becomes the foundation of our church. Because Pastor Mitchell now understood this, every believer should witness. It, it is wrong for us to hire somebody to witness for us. If you are saved, you should witness. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to wait, go through a class. The moment you get saved, you should witness. And Pastor Mitchell began to preach this. We began to uh, practice this. This is very common in the Jesus movement now, uh, starting in the late 60s. For us, of course, it started in 1970. Uh, early in 1970, we began to get these people uh, saved. And when hippies got saved, they immediately began to witness. This is what happened all across America, not just our church, is they would get saved and everywhere they went, they would witness. They would tell people about Jesus. Very, very common, I told you that uh, Ron Burrow wrote letters. That is what happened, even in our church. Michelle Greeley came over to attend Prescott College Every good greenie should go to Prescott College and uh, move from Massachusetts to go to college, got saved, and Michelle began to write letters home, began to tell everybody. And uh, here, Bruce Cutter is here today. Uh, I don't know if Steve Welch ever got one of those letters, but she wrote Mark Olson and uh, various ones and telling them about Jesus I said last week, all of those that came from, um, uh, from Massachusetts, a lot of that was just letters home. It, 
Some of you can't relate to not having a cell phone and easy access. Back then it cost money to call long distance. And so what people would do, they would write letters, but personal witness is foundational to who we are. To this day, you hear sermons urging evangelism. That's our, that's our duty as believers is to witness. And then a further witness is the motivation of pre-tribulation rapture. We believe in the rapture of the church, the disappearance where God will take instantly every true believer up to heaven. Now, you understand that there are other beliefs about the rapture. There are people who believe that all Christians will go through the tribulation and will be killed in the tribulation or the rapture will happen at the end. There are people in the middle, other dumb versions, and they are dumb. I'm not going into it. But historically, who witnesses the most? People who believe in a pre tribulation rapture. If you believe that the rapture comes first and then every person on earth is facing judgment in a living hell on earth and then they are facing a literal eternal hell, that provides powerful motivation to witness. In the Jesus movement, mixed in with God nationally touching young people and them getting saved was preaching and a, and a belief in the rapture. Put up on the, the screen here, uh, there was a book. Uh, how many of you ever had this book in the day? How Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth. This is one of the first books on the rapture. It made powerful waves. Anybody who read that, it fueled the fire. I want to witness them. Next uh, photo that we have there. Did you get the, is there a photo of a newspaper there? Missed that one. My scribe didn't get that one. Okay, there was, a, I don't know if you remember this, the, the picture I was wanting to have was, um, it was a, a newspaper as though uh, what the headlines would be after the rapture. I don't know if any of you remember, remember that. You would, you'd give that to people. This is what it's going to be like. And so there, this was a, uh, something that was fueling the Jesus movement was pre-tribulation rapture. In other words, I want the people that I care for to get saved so that they miss that. If you believe in post-tribulation rapture, you don't have that motivation. We're all going to go through hell together. Right? There's not the same motivation. If you want your family to miss the tribulation and judgment, you want to witness. Listen to this. Preston Nix, he's a, a scholar who, who studies the Jesus movement. He says one of the things, the biggest things out of the Jesus movement was that we wanted our friends to be saved. We wanted everyone to know the Lord. The signature song of the Jesus movement was Randy Newman's I Wish We'd All Been Ready. We didn't want our friends to be left behind when the rapture came. And that was true. The Jesus movement is the motivation. We understood when the rapture comes, all opportunities to evangelize are finished. John 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Okay, that is a truth. Jesus said, that's how I approach life. Night is coming. In those days, they didn't have lights. So when the sun went down, you stopped working. There, no more. He said, that is, night is coming. When the rapture happens, there are no more chances. If you want to witness to your family, you better do it before the rapture because there will be no more chances after. And so that was foundational. We believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. To this day, we've never deviated from that. We still preach that, and that is still a motivation today. Moving on, I, I told you Ron Burrow began to witness to the other three members of the band that he had played with as a sinner, Eden. They all got saved, and so now Eden began to play for Jesus. When Don Madison came over, uh, and brought his band, he heard Eden play, 
And so he invited them to come to La Habra, California to play at his coffee house ministry that they had in La Habra. It was called The Vine. And he also wanted them to come and record some tracks. He had a compilation album of various bands that were going uh, at that time. So I got a picture here. This is Eden playing. That is uh, The Vine. This is actually where my dad, Ron Burl and Ron Jones, initially saw the whole idea of a concert ministry or a coffee house ministry. This is Eden, now they're saved and they are playing at this place uh, called The Vine. Don Madison invited Eden to go on a tour with him. Covadas, the other band, and uh, Eden, they uh, were gonna go on a tour uh, doing outreaches through the Midwest. Primarily, this was universities. And they did this, uh, and they uh, did all kinds of outreaches at universities. So now, think about this. They got saved. Now they're touring, but they are separated from a local church. So two things about this is, first of all, that's not good for you. You've just gotten saved, and now you're not hearing preaching. You're, you're, there's no spiritual life. You're off being a star, and they discovered this is not healthy for you to live like this. But then the second thing was, while they're away from the local church, the local outreach is harmed. They could have been helping a local church, but they weren't. So, uh, in speaking to my dad, my dad challenged them to, to return home, but he gave them a challenge. We want to open our own coffee house ministry. Again, coffee had almost nothing to do with it, but that's what they called it. In other words, we want to open our regular concert. Never mind booking the boys club every once in a while. We want to have a regular coffee house ministry like the vine. There were numbers of these that were going on uh, across America, but my dad challenged them if we're going to have a regular coffee house ministry, you have to make a commitment. It doesn't work without commitment. All right, here's the lesson that we're going to have that is foundational to our church is the power of commitment. Biblically, God honors faithfulness. What it means to be faithful, it means to be reliable. That's, you can be counted on. So there are people who don't mind doing something every once in a while, if I feel like it, you know, if, I, if there's nothing good on TV, if no one's visiting, the weather is uh, acceptable. Sure, I could make a contribution, but to be faithful means we can count on you. And Dad said, we want to open a concert ministry but you have to make a commitment because God honors faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Okay, steward is a manager. God gives you something. He expects you to manage it for him. And the Bible says, you be faithful. In this case, these young men had been given musical talent. How many of you know not everybody has musical talent, right? Some people we would pay to listen to them. Some we will pay if they promise never to sing, right? So they have something, but God expects you to use it for him. I told you last week that God told a young man to come challenge them uh, uh, in, in Canto Park in Phoenix when they're sinners, to challenge them. They need to repent, music's your idol, but part of that was you need to play for me. And so my dad said, you're, here's the challenge. He said, you are going to have to make a commitment. You're going to have to prompt. You want to be a star? You, know, you want to wander off here, there, and do your own thing? Then you can't be a part of what we're doing here. So I want you to make a commitment. You're going to be there faithfully every week. Number two, he made them promise you're going to be in church. 
I don't have any interest in you. You come, be a star. Oh, aren't you awesome? And then we don't see you at church. So you're going to make a commitment. You will be faithful to the church. And back then, I don't know uh, whether they got into it, but things that we expect in ministry, we want you to pray. We want you to have spiritual life. If it's just talent and you don't, you're not connected to God, that's not going to help. We want you to pray. And then, of course, tithing. Christians tithe. You want to be in ministry, you don't want to tithe. We don't want you in ministry because there's something wrong uh, uh, with that. And so they did. These young men made a commitment. Yes, we will do that. Making a commitment, it's healthy for you. It is healthy. You need church. You need spiritual life. It's healthy for other people. This is my father's concern is... Any person who is in the public eye, people are looking at you as an example. What is a Christian? Who is it you see the most? The people in the public eye on stage. So it is good for people to see every time I come to church, they're there. I see them praying, right? So people are referencing what is a Christian? Okay, I see that person. So making a commitment is healthy, not just for you. It's healthy for other people. And then it's healthy for the ministry. We can plan outreaches if we know you'll be there. We can advertise knowing you'll be there. Years ago, we had a man that was tremendously talented. He could sing. And the moment he say, people will be drawn, but... He was, he was a pain in the butt because it was like, I don't feel like playing tonight. I don't care if you feel like playing tonight. There are sinners going to be, we need you. And it was always like, finally we said, hey, don't play then. I would rather have somebody less talented who's faithful, committed, than to be dealing with prima donna. We got to beg you to play. No, thank you. So the power of commitment, that is a powerful thing. So when these four guys said, yes, we will commit ourselves, my dad found a building. We wouldn't have fit in Lincoln Street, but little did my dad know how powerful this was, a building outside the church, and he found it to rent. Remember in my lesson last week, the church was struggling financially when he first took it over. The first concert, apparently my parents raided their meager savings to come up with 35 bucks to rent a PA system. So my dad found a little storefront building uh, on Granite Street in downtown, South Granite Street in Prescott, Arizona. It's the building across from Fancy That. I think it sells furniture or, or something today. But in order to have this concert ministry, we had to buy equipment. We didn't have any. Secondly, now the ch church building was paid for. Now we got to pay rent. So how are we going to pay for the equipment and the rent? And so Pastor Mitchell took a pledge. Here's the lesson. It's the power of financial commitment. For the very first time in our church, he took a pledge for the concert ministry. He said, people, we need to buy equipment. Here's the vision. You know those things we're doing in the boys club? We're going to be able to do that every week. But we have to have money so we can buy equipment and we have to then increase our expenses by rent on the building and he said, how many of you would be willing to make a pledge? A pledge simply means a promise for an amount of money. It's promised for a purpose, in this case, to open a, a, a concert ministry. That was the very first outreach pledge we ever took in our church. And we have been doing that since 1970. 53 years later, I just did it like last month. Now it's... Now we're talking about expenses that are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But this is what happens. A vision is presented. When I put pictures up of the churches we're planting, 
I'm saying that's the vision. You see the people getting saved in Nepal and Colombia and in Tampa or wherever it is that we're, we have churches. How many of you are willing to, this is not the tithe, this is above the tithe, how many of you would be willing to invest? That's what an outreach pledge, and we have done that since that day. So this enables, a, a pledge enables every person to participate in what we're pledging for. In this case, it's a concert ministry. Non-musicians can play a part in the concert ministry by giving to it. There are some people you have never, ever, ever sang a song, played a note, done anything, but by giving, you participate in what it is. Older people, concert ministry is by and large young people. That's just the way it is. The most likely people to come out are young people. Older people are not excluded from what God is doing. You don't have to come and have your ears bleed from rap music. That's fine. But by giving, you are now a part of it. And so in late 1970, we uh, had this uh, concert ministry. They're kicking around ideas. What are we going to call this new concert ministry? And Ron Burrow said, how about The Door, based on uh, John 10. And in 1970, we opened this little building in Granite Street. Got a picture here. Here is the Eden playing now. Now they're playing for Jesus, having made a commitment, and they're going to play Friday and Saturday night. The concert in those days was two nights a week. It was two complete sets or two co complete concerts a night, and that building was jam-packed every night with sinners young people getting saved. Got another picture here. This is actual the building uh, that you see there. You can see on the far right, there's Harold Warner. You see him, Ernie Lister. Uh, I see the Copeland girls, Rob Ray, Steve Haru on the far left. Uh, I think that's Janet uh, Payson, Janet Foley, right in the middle, and uh, some others that are a little harder to see. But young people, were coming and getting saved in this uh, concert ministry. That was 1970. We have held concerts continuously since 1970. For 53 years, we still hold concerts to this day. Now, various locations. That was Granite Street. Then we moved. We had a building uh, for a short time on Goodwin Street. Then... Uh, the old Food Queen, we took that over, that went out of business. Food Queen on the corner of Alarkin and uh, Goodwin. Then for a while we had it in uh, uh, the, uh, below, uh, in the basement of Ruth Street in our church. Then we moved to Gurley Street, right at the corner of the plaza, in the corner of Montezuma and Gurley, called the Underground. And then uh, in our current location is 180. Let's look at some pictures through the years of concert ministry. Here is Living Waters. That's the, the girls group. Um, you see here, I think that that, I can't tell if that's Mona or Veronica or her sister. That's my sister Sharon, Bobby McKinney, Janet Payson, Margaret. That's uh, just a portion of them. Cameras weren't wide enough to fit all the girls back then because uh, there were so many of them. Next picture. Here's a early, some early concert. I don't know what building that is. On the right, that's John Myola, Randy Wollen playing bass uh, there in uh, various versions. Next picture, here's an early concert on Goodwin Street in another building. Uh, I don't know what band that is. Next picture, here is in the door. This is in the basement. That's Jeff Day as a young disciple pulling the altar call Ruth Street is uh, near and dear to my heart. Right there, standing in front of where Jeff is, that's where I got saved. It was in a concert ministry. I got saved in that very building. Knelt down probably about where that little kid's laying on the floor there. He didn't realize how holy it was <laughs> because that's where I got saved. Next picture. Here's a, a band playing. There's Jack Connolly. Uh, I can't tell if that's Barb or Bev. 
playing George Shields, uh, playing the violin. I think that that is Susan Mammon, if I'm uh, right, and Bob Mammon. On the right, next picture, then we move to the underground, downtown. Now we got fancier lights. Uh, things slightly change, but essentially the same thing. Then we moved, bought a building, uh, the 180 where we currently are uh, right now. And there you see in a band, next one. Here's uh, our own Frank uh, playing uh, at 180. And then the next picture in August, this is our new building in Prescott Valley. And they say that that will be open in August of this year. So, music has changed. We're not playing the exact same music we played in 1970. Uh, the equipment is better. The lights are better. There's video. There's drama we'll talk about. That was added later on. But essentially, the concert ministry is basically the same as it's been since 1970. Why do we have it? To draw a crowd. If you witness to people, and then, uh, you know, come to church. But to them, that might be, you know, the steeple, the weird guy in a dress that they grew up with, you know, various things. Nah, come to a concert. Okay, I like music, right? So we're still using that today. So here's the lesson. This is the power of a concert ministry. Why do we do concerts? Number one, because people get saved. Last night, this is 2023, 53 years later, two people got saved in the concert last night. It still works to this day. Sinners who may never come to church, they can come to a concert and hear uh, the gospel. Let's, let's see some pictures. This is what it's all about. There's the underground on the right, 180 on the left. People at the altar, that's why we do it. It's not about making people stars. I don't care if you're ever a star. I don't want you to be a star. Your head wouldn't fit in the building, but I want people to get saved. That's what it is. Next one, here is various altar calls, and that is why we have concert ministry is, is getting people saved. Then we have, why do we have concert ministry? The lesson is the power of commitment to a larger cause. Jesus saves you, you can live, if you're not living in sin, you can choose what you, do, what you want to do with your life. You can spend the rest of your life playing video games and watching Netflix, if you want, and just come to church whenever you feel like it. But if you do, you're going to be wasting the life that God gave you. You know what? It's very healthy that you give out to other people. So one of the things that happens in a concert ministry is sinners get saved. It's for them. That's primarily why we do it. But we have people who come also making a commitment, and they come and make a contribution. Some people, they come early and pray, establishing the spiritual dimension of what God is going to do. Others, they're witnessing before the concert, trying to get them out. There are... Christians, if you come, you're attuned, who is not saved here or might not be saved, dealing with them at the altar. Then we have people who play, they are musical, so they play in bands. We have drama, people involved in the drama. Then there are other people, they help with video, lights, refreshments, nursery. I think numbers of years ago, I, I counted up an average night. We have in our concert ministry about 100 people that play various different roles in putting on a concert ministry. That's healthy for you. There's something powerful about you giving out, not just taking, how can I give out? Concert ministry makes you make a commitment to a larger cause. And then, why do we have concert ministry? Concert ministry is training ground for larger ministry for disciples. I pulled my first altar call in a, in a concert. Concert ministry is profound because the pastors, while we provide oversight, we don't run it. We have a concert director. We have guys that are pulling altar calls. So what happens is you get a guy in an altar who is, or the concert director as it may be, 
Pastor, there were no visitors tonight, or there were visitors and no one got saved. And our question is, what are you going to do about that? Because that's training ground for pastoring. Young men, what we do is we plant churches. We'll get to that vision later on. But if you were in a city and no visitors were in your church, what are you going to do about it? You need a miracle. You need to learn dominion, how to pray through and, and uh, uh, cause people to be drawn or cause people to get saved. That's training ground. It's very powerful. We have uh, only the Lord knows how many hundred uh, uh, couples we've sent out of our church, hundreds of couples that we've sent out of our church through the years. Almost all of them had training one way or another in our concert ministry. Just look just at a, a few of these. Here's an early picture of Harold Warner before his accident. He's now paralyzed in a wheelchair. And this wasn't the concert. He didn't dress like that. He told me this was... A, he was going to preach in a, in a church somewhere. This was an early promo uh, for this. But Harold Warner was one of the early ones in the concert ministry. He learned to preach by pulling altar calls in the door. Next picture, Rich Cox. Rich Cox was an undercover narcotics detective, told me he was called. He, he, was, uh, he, he looked like a dirt bag, and I said, Rich, you can't, you can't preach looking like a dirt bag. And Rich... Shave said he wanted to preach here at one of our early uh, major events. I can't remember this is the wrestling one or whatever we did. Rich is pulling the altar call. He's a preacher of the gospel. Harold Warner, the one, has a powerful church impact all around the world. Rich Cox, one of the leaders in our, our fellowship, he learned in the concert ministry. Next picture, our very own Paul Arps, uh, now a missionary in Kathmandu, Nepal in the concert ministry. Next picture, here's a young man who used to have hair. <laughs> I learned to preach in the concert ministry. That's Perth, West Australia, uh, where my wife and I were living. And uh, I learned that in the concert ministry. And then we have future men of God, our very own Matt Sanderlin. So in our fellowship, I, this is who we are. I urge, I know there are people watching online, you need a concert ministry because it's powerful. Not only to get people saved, but it does so many other things in the life of the church. It is who we are. This is where it came from, the Jesus movement, originally in 1970, but that is something. We will be having concert ministry when Jesus comes back. And we're going to continue because this is where we came from. That's who we are. Amen. God bless you. We're going to stop there. We're stopping a little, uh, a little early, but uh, I think they're asking parents if you would not rush back. They don't want you to get your kids till 25 after. But uh, we're going to continue next week. We'll now move on and uh, other lessons that we learned, and then we'll get into church planting and some other things. God bless you. We'll stop there.